As we laid out in the first episode of this series, music in general, and particular rock music, was in a pretty downbeat state at the point the 60s turned into the 70s. The buoyant spirit of the Woodstock generation quickly turned into a mire of violence, death, and a realisation that good vibes and peace signs would not change a reactionary system or heal a deeply bleeding world. In that period, from 1968 through 1970, it was as if rock ceased to be a child and it gave away childish things. Music went from being a transitory three-minute parade of transcendent moments to communal worship and study of the statement record. Beards were sprouted, denims donned, woodshedding gotten down to, and the rock world in large became a parade of dour singer-songwriters, mellow country rock act, gloomy metal merchants, interminable jam bands, indecipherable prog bands, and interchangeable boogie blues bands. Whether they were getting back to roots or heading for the outer limits, what they all had in common was an ethos that rock was all about the music, and such folder roll as the previous trappings of pop marketing and presentation was straight Cornball and Squaresville. By 1970, the dividing line between pop and rock seemed absolute. Pop music was dominated by studio-based bubblegum acts, at this point enjoying its golden era, as rock bands seemed to strip off all of the artifice and paraphernalia of teenage fandom they'd accumulated in the 60s and traded it in for a quest for credibility in the eyes of a maturing audience, and this left a void for both the generation of younger fans coming through at the end of the 60s who sought their own sense of identity and identification and demarcation for their generation, and for the media especially the expanding medium of television, who needed something energetic, colourful, controversial and edgy to fill their screens, not mopey old rock bands who looked earth just to be there. And what filled the need for both that generation and the media turned out to be glam rock. Glam, initially more by accident than design, was a reaction to the increasing withdrawal of rock music from its audience. But it's not as if Chilita Secunda and Mark Bolan woke up one morning and said, I'm going to invent glam rock. Glam rock was initially a reductional thing. It took some elements of the bands that came before it, the strut of the Rolling Stones, the sense of modish style from bands like the Small Faces, the greasy decadence of the Velvet Underground, and the sense of visual flair from the psychedelic groups, but welded these contemporary affectations to deliberately simple music form, evoking the earliest style of rock and roll. And this wasn't limited to just the music. It learned from the flamboyance of Little Richard or Jerry Lee Lewis and the overt sensuality of a Gene Vincent or an Elvis Presley. It evoked for the young a sense of simplicity, of group identity, of being able to be danced to, and of being separate from the heavier, more young adult-oriented musics that had evolved out of the 60s. It lasted for four or so years, but it never really went away after it stopped being an identifiable force on the charts, either by evolution. It's fairly easy to see, for example, the relationship between glam and the English version of punk rock, or by callback, especially in certain new wave of British heavy metals or poodle rock bands of the late 80s to early 90s. In mid-90s Britpop, especially Oasis and Suede, and even in contemporary acts like the Struts, the Lemon Twigs or the Velveteers. Sonically, glam was a reaction against the hairier and heavier direction in which rock as a whole was going, but it wasn't a mere pastiche of the rock and roll style that its performance ethos invinced. Glam used all of the latest production techniques, and acts like T-Rex or Roxy Music were assiduous in the way they constructed their records for effect. Glam generally traded flashy playing for flashy presentation, and it was consciously vigorous and ephemeral, whereas rock was dressed down and dedicated to building artifacts to last. Oscar Wilde once said, moderation is a fatal thing, nothing succeeds like excess. As we saw in the fourth instalment of this series, Led Zeppelin applied an absolutely unselfconscious approach to glorious excess down every avenue. Glam was just as much larger than life, but it was acutely self-conscious, verging into the fields of self-parody and almost into the classically grotesque. Elton John, not strictly a glam rocker himself, was a very self-knowing example of this. This was the starkest point of contrast between glam and the general direction of rock music at the time. Rock saw authenticity as a new orthodoxy, whereas glam went out of its way to draw attention to itself as being phony. Glam also very deliberately drew attention to its successes, in contrast with the deep, heavy world of rock music, anti-glam as it might be. Glam was deliberately frivolous, disposable, and hyperactive, and in this, coupled with its bare-boned and stomping musical approach aimed at primarily a young teen audience, it created a wall of shock and awe that swept all before it from 1971 to 1974. Glam was also an inversion of the community values currently allied to rock. Whereas rock was all about community and commonality, glam rock was gang mentality and tribalism. 
there was no interest in creating a community of artists to change the world and bring about ridiculous notions of revolution. Glam stars had to be seen to be mad hedonists driven by the individual pursuit of fame and ecstasy, and each member of the tribe was permitted to follow as did the chief. I'm the leader of the gang I am, declared Gary Glitter. Mama, we're all crazy now, declared Slade. Like every musical fad, glam has a beginning, a ground zero, it has an end, and it has a before the beginning and an after the end. It's commonly held that the glam bomb first dropped quite by accident on February 25, 1971, when one Chalita Secunda decided at the last minute to daub some glue and nail polish under the eyes of Mark Boland, just before he walked out to mime his semi-hit Hot Love on top of the pops. The beatifically faced Boland, clad in a too tight silver jacket and seeming like a warbling pixie from Venus under an improbably huge mass of corkscrew curls, was a sensation. Hot Love jumped the next week from 17 to 7, and the next week it was number one, where it stayed for another five weeks before it was dethroned by David Ansel Collins's irresistible double barrel. And that appearance, that simple symbol of decadence and the loss of restraint in the silver jacket and the eye makeup, coupled with the perfect, slinky, danceable, stripped-back rock song, on top of the pops, lit the touch paper for what we now know as glam rock. Boland followed up Hot Love with Get It On in July, which was a four weeks number one. September saw the release of the eight-week number one album, Electric Warrior, which was then followed by the masterful Jeefster single, which was kept off number one by newly arrived glam rival Slade with Cause I Love You, and then Benny Hill's decidedly unglam Ernie. Soon, there were a slew of glam rock stars banging up the UK charts and bouncing off the US ones, but each of these acts had, and at times, not especially glamorous life before glam. Mark Boland was no stranger to the UK charts. Electric Warrior was his sixth album. The previous five, One ST Rex and Forest Tyrannosaurus Rex, evolved from a ramshackle psychedelic folk duo to incorporate electric instruments. He'd had three UK Top 40 and one Top 10 album and a number two hit single with Rider White Swan. Electric Warrior still incorporated a lot of his psych and fantasy lyrical themes. They were just framed in a pulsing, string-gliding, fuzz-punctuated brew of Chuck Berryisms, which still holds up impeccably today. The glam group that followed T-Rex into the charts was the larger and louder-than-life Slade. Slade, who at one point had 17 consecutive UK Top 20 singles and amassed six number ones, had scuffled about on the fringes of the UK industry for five years under a variety of names, including Ambrose Slade, which they arrived at courtesy of a hippie receptionist at their record company, and they announced themselves in April 1971 with Get Down, Get With It, and then hit number one at the start of November with Cause I Love You, and followed it up with Look What You've Done, which hit number four. Two more chart toppers in 1972 with Take Me Back Home and Mama We're All Crazy Now, as well as a number two with the brilliant Goodbye to Jane, and three number ones in 1973, Come On Feel the Noise, Squeeze Me, Please Me, and their apogee Merry Christmas Everyone, along with another number two in My Friend Stan, saw Slade do no wrong. But they only managed two number threes and a number two in 1974. Glam rock faded away then, but Slade remained remarkably durable, their singles still hitting the top 20 until January 1977 when Gypsy Roadhog was widely banned because of the druggy lyrics and stalled at 48. There were a few more hits, their last top 40 coming in 1991. The Sweet, or Sweet as Takes Your Fancy, added a crucial new element to the equation with their Who On Speed banshee-backed fuzzy pop singles. The Sweet first hit as a homegrown bubblegum group, but after a tepid response, the band's producers Mickey Chin and Michael Chapman decided to tough their sound up, producing the mighty Little Willie, upping the thumping drums and hitching their start of the rising glam movement. Not quite as ubiquitous as Slade, Sweet did manage nine top ten singles and one number one with Blockbuster, and four number twos, Teenage Rampage, Hellraiser, The Ballroom Blitz and Fox on the Run, which was probably the last great glam rock single. Sweet were one of the few bands to survive the glam era and transition into a legitimate pop rock band before they split in 1979. I referenced the influence of glam on the new wave of British heavy metal and the hair bands in the late 80s and mid 90s. Check out the guitar tone on Sweet's 1972 number 2 Hellraiser or 1975's Action. These sounds come up time and again in those later records. Gary Glitter, who took the glam image to an immediately and ridiculously self-parodying level, it's impossible to look at old film of him these days and not think at first it isn't Benny Hill doing a send-up of a glam rock star per his famous Mick Jagger impersonation. Overweight, an apathetic dancer and more a grunter than a singer, 11 straight top 10 singles with 3 number 1s and 4 number 2s rather belies my tragicomic description. 
Anyway, while Glitter took the visual side of glam to a ridiculous extreme, his producer Mike Leander, who'd previously arranged the beautiful strings on the Beatles' She's Leaving Home, reduced his music to an almost Neanderthal simplicity. Single string guitar riffs, plenty of fuzz, the bass that plodded that head nod beat, chanted backing vocals, plenty of hand claps, and crucially, double drumming. It's always hard to divorce the notion of Gary Glitter from the depraved and irredeemable monster who created him, but I grew up on a box of his singles, and I still love to hear them when they pop up on Spotify. I went for a long time where I couldn't listen to them, but then I thought, you know, get the love dogs. So, like, if even the worst dude ever can do one good thing, I figure enjoying a few great records doesn't make poor Gad any less of an abomination. Further down the glam food chain, and even further into self-parody, if that was at all possible, was Alvin Stardust, who had a 1974 UK number two, and a number one in my hometown, with My Kukachu, and then hit the top with his next single, Jealous Mind, followed by a half a dozen other top 20 hits. Dressed from head to toe in black leather, invoking either Vince Taylor or Gene Vincent, Stardust was actually a couple of people. Svengali producer Peter Shelley sang My Kukachu, and a chap called Shane Fenton sang Jealous Mind. But Shane Fenton wasn't even Shane Fenton. He was Bernard Jury, a boy who pal in Liverpool of George Harrison and Paul McCartney, who was a roadie in the early 60s for a band called Shane Fenton and the Fentones. The band had won a recording contract, but Fenton, who was only 17 years old, died of rheumatic fever before he could make the record, so Jury was persuaded by Fenton's parents to replace him and take the name of their deceased juvenile. The Fentones went on to have quite a few minor pre-Beatles hits. My Kukachu is a stone classic glam rocker. Stone classic! Jealous Mind not nearly as good, and Jury, despite being a better singer, doesn't sound anything like Shelley. Jury today still performs as Alvin and Stardust. From A Stardust to Z Stardust, David Bowie was nothing if not an astute opportunist, having hopped from style to style trying to find a commercial breakthrough and a platform for his astonishing talents, and finding the heavy hippie camps a commercial dead end for him because Bowie is at heart a pop songwriter, a very idiosyncratic one, but nonetheless. He got hit to the phenomenal success of his good friend and former guitarist Mark Boland, and in June 1972 he jumped on the glam train with abandon, releasing the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars often seen as the ultimate artifact of the glam rock era, and his appearance on Top of the Pops singing Starman in July 6, 1972 as the high watermark of the movement, it was to my mind of thinking that T-R-A-F-O-Z-S-A-T-S-F-M was Bowie presenting himself as the man with the necessary skill set to take glam to a more critically legitimate place. Starman made number 10. Bowie had considerably less success on the singles chart during his glam days than others, with five subsequent top fives, number two being the highest for Gene Genie, and, unlike all the other acts, he managed to create some movement in the US. He did, however, have highly successful albums. Aladdin Sane, Pin Ups and Diamond Dogs all made number one in the UK, and Diamond Dogs made number five in the US. Susie Quattro, a transplanted Detroiter, made some brilliant singles on the R.A.K. label, which, denied as she might, place her in the first rank of glam rockers. She was even more popular in Australia than the UK, and in my hometown became one of only four artists who've ever had as many as three number one singles in the whole of the 1970s, and she is still welcomed back here regularly on tour. She is not the only female voice in the golden age of glam, but she is the most important both within the genre and without it, as one of the most convincing and committed of female rockers, and the first in a great line of kick-ass female bass players. Wizard, led by one of rock's great mad scientists in Roy Wood, had three number ones with gloriously overblown maximalist glam, including the anthemic See My Baby Jive. Mud, a lightweight psychedelic pop band who were reinvented as a borderline glam bubblegum act at R.A.K., ran up ten top ten hits with three number ones including Tiger Feet, the biggest hit of 1974, and a number two with them all the time sounding like a lightweight version of The Sweet. There were many other artists who either managed brilliant moments or were peripherally associated with the movement, more through image than perhaps music. Roxy Music are occasionally branded glam, if only for Brian Ferry's old-school Hollywood persona and Brian Eno's eccentric costume and makeup. But Roxy were far too ideas-driven over the first two albums for them to truly fall in with glam, driven as that was by tight, simple motifs. Similarly, there were several acts that incorporated a sense of theatricality and the grandiose in their presentation, but they weren't glam. Queen, although they veer close now and then, Mott the Hoople, despite the Bowie endorsement, sensational Alex Harvey band, and several American acts, Alice Cooper and the New York Dolls, Sparks, Silverheads, The Tubes, or perhaps the most directly glam-influenced major US band, Kiss, who were basically a US version of Slade. 
Most genuine of the Americans was the slightly tragic Joe Braith. While glam and its rejection of the button-down nature of rock mainstream celebrated sexual decadence, deviance and diversity, or at least varying degrees of pantomime involving it, Joe Braith was the only openly gay man on the scene. Joe Braith gave us two albums both drawn from the same set of sections. His self-titled debut, released in an unprecedented blaze of hype, mixes the heavier edge of Bowie's Ziggyism with flourishes that presage some of Queen's fussier moments, and is charming and very interesting. The second album, Creatures of the Street, is more of the same, but the shock of the new was gone and Joe Braith went back to theatre. In 1983, he became one of the first well-known musicians to die of AIDS. And what became of the progenitor of all this foolishness, Mark Bolan and T-Rex? From 1970, T-Rex's British singles that placed 2 one one two one one two. In 1973, his three singles placed 3, 4 and 12. Tanks, the follow-up to the slider, stalled at number 4. Three singles he released, Solid Gold Easy Action, 20th Century Boy and Truck on Tyke, were all great to very good, but somehow his cool and danceable style was being overwhelmed by the more visceral takes from bands like Slade and the Sweet and his friend David Bowie, who unlike any other glam act, was breaking in the US. Tank showed him introducing new elements to his music, but his approach to songwriting didn't really change, and I suspect he just became unexciting to his audience. His cocaine habit and weight gain couldn't have helped, although <laughs> Gary Glitter ruled the charts and he could barely squeeze into his jumpsuit. With Truck on Tyke, he just seemed to drop off the face of the earth. The 1974 album Zinc Alloy was scoffed at, while it contained some really cool songs, Venus Loon, Explosive Mouth, Teenage Dream, the vocal treatments, the weird James Brown diversions, the grating mix, intrusive backing singers, and some a pretty perfunctory filler all seemed to lessen what would probably have been a pretty good album if it was three songs shorter and Bolden had let Tony Visconti do his job. The accompanying single, The Groover though, is Prime T-Rex. The album stalled at number 14 and The Groover got no higher than number 4 and it was his last ever top 10. 1975's Bolden's Zip Gun didn't even make the charts, easily his poorest album. 1976 saw Futuristic Dragon, an album I have a lot of time for if not a lot of other fans do, and 1977's Dandy in the Underworld saw him go back to pretty much the old T-Rex group, getting up to number 26 and garnering highly positive reviews. Bolan was something of a sponsor to the punk bands that grew up listening to him, especially The Damned and Billy Idol's Generation X. Of course, it all ended in terrible tragedy, Bolan perishing in a car crash in West London on September 16th, 1977. Glam was, to all intents and purposes, over by the end of 1974. David Bowie's bleak and decidedly bitter take on glam Diamond Dogs was its epitaph. It passed like all other fads did and his main players either burned out, lost the public fancy or evolved into different types of bands. The fact it never broke in the USA saw a lot of good bands move on in it for a few years, a few singles longer. It was, of course, the foundation stone for punk rock, at least the English version of it, so we have that to be thankful for. Hello everybody, it's your good friend and neighbour Fowl Quince. Now we've just heard a potted history of glam rock. Now I can assure you that in real life glam rock was a lot more exciting, a lot more complex and a lot broader than anything that I've just explained to you there. And it had its day and, and it was all jolly fun while it's lasted and 50 years on we all look back and go, oh those silly kids. But to us silly kids, it was an awful big deal. For me, it was the first time that music actually existed beyond anonymous voices on the radio. These were people that I got out, I saw pictures of, I engaged with other media of them, and it was tremendously exciting. Mark Bolden was my first ever musical hero, and today he is still my greatest ever musical hero. For this 20th century boy, glam rock is always part of the background radiation of all music. I hope that if you're new to it, this little video helps you feel the noise.